Hello my friends, welcome back to another video. Today I'm going to talk about a really quite difficult uh, article. It is not available online, so I apologize for that, but it's from the, the uh, journal Synthes, or Synthes, from July 2004. And the author is Stephen T. Kuhn. And the article is entitled, Reflections on Ethics and Game Theory. Okay, so the key word here is uh, reflections. So it's not that uh, the author is offering a argument. He's offering several arguments, several observations, uh, but he is not um, putting forth a single thesis through the article. And it's quite long. It's uh, with its appendices and footnotes, it's 44 pages long. Without those, it's about, I guess, 35 pages or so. Anyway, the article is really difficult. Um, if, if you don't know how to read it, I suppose, or if you don't know how to simplify it for your own purposes. Um, there's a lot of uh, logical equations. If you've never heard of symbolic logic, um, it's a crazy, it's a crazy th thing. Uh, I took a course on symbolic logic in, in uh, university and almost failed it, but I ended up doing okay. But uh, I could do it again today and just, you know, uh, <laughs> as if I was going from scratch. Anyway, symbolic logic is sort of mathematics, but it's mathematics geared to uh, logic in a sense. You have your you have your quantifiers and your amplifiers and your this and your that symbols, and uh, it's really quite complicated. I'll make sure I put up some of these equations so you know kind of what uh, what I'm talking about. So uh, ultimately, um, the author is reflecting on uh, this this field called game theory. Um, game theory is basically the investigation of uh, strategies. So f forget about games, like in the sense of video games or board games or whatever. Just think of life in general. Um, it's applicable to board games or anything. Um, you know, the most famous of the game theory examples of, is, of course, the prisoner's dilemma. If you haven't heard of the pr prisoner's dilemma, just Google it. It's it's a really simple uh, what to do. It's about do I cooperate? Do I uh, think of my own short-term gains or my short-term interest? Uh, do I think of long-term interest? How do I anticipate what my opponent is doing? That kind of thing. So, um, so Kuhn, um, his name looks familiar to me. So I imagine he's quite a leader in this in this field. So the reason I looked at it. Um, I, I studied a bit of uh, this topic, game theory, when I was doing my philosophy degree, and I, I found it really quite interesting. Um, and, you know, I like the whole idea, like as a writer, as a, as a fiction writer, you always, you're always thinking about people, people's um, motivations, people's responses, people's actions and reactions, uh, theoretical or actual. And uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. So. I, I suppose one of the things that you, you need to uh, you need to realize first is that game theory um, seems primarily predicated on a notion, an anthropological notion that people do what's in their own best interest. So, um, you know, and and of course Kuhn talks about uh, the best interests of the community and how the community uh, facilitates you know, the individual's best interest and vice versa. I mean, these are things that, these are very old concepts. Plato talked about this in uh, several of his dialogues, um, talking about, you know, is selfishness good? Is selfishness always self-defeating? That kind of thing. Is what's good for the individual good for society? Do the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few type thing like that? So obviously these are perennial questions in philosophy. Now, the point is, how does ethics come into it? Because game theory is predicated on winning or maximizing uh, what's in your interest. And that's not necessarily an ethical question, is it? Or is it, uh, for instance, Plato uh, would, would constantly reaffirm his belief that what's good for the individual is good for the community and vice versa. And that might involve a fundamental uh, 
shift in society, right? Um, you know, in, in the last article, I talked about friendship in Plato. And so the question is, um, you know, and, and, and there I talked about the alienation of the philosopher. And this is something that also Plato deals with in the allegory of the cave. He says, you know, the, when the person leaves the cave and they've discovered truth, um, does he have a duty to come back to the people in the cave and tell them about the truth? And what kind of reaction will they have? Um, prophets never welcomed in his own hometown, right? Uh, well, prophets are, are usually not welcomed anywhere. So, okay, so that's one point. And so the question is in general, do ethics and game theory have anything to do with each other? Um, I think Kuhn makes some good observations and um, my, my initial, my initial thought in going into this article was that they are opposed, you know, uh, working from a Platonic or a Kantian notion of the good, of the moral good of a moral act, um, th self-interest um, in a material sense seems to be the exact opposite. So Kant says you got to do good things because they're good. Um, and, and your only, your only motive should be that it is because it is good. So you do what's good because it's good. And if you do it because it's beneficial, you're not acting morally, or at least not as morally. So you could have both motivations running through, but he says that the only, uh, one that counts is doing the good because it's good. Now you could say I'm doing it because it's good and I'm also doing it because, um, I don't know, makes my kids happy or it fills my stomach or whatever. Okay. So let me just quote, let me just quote the author here for a second. He says on page 17 of the article, he says, I believe that the game theoretical investigations do have normative import. It seems implausible that a theory that explained exactly how we came to hold the moral beliefs that we do would have no implications about whether we should act on them. And he, he then wants to talk about a distinction between descriptive ethics and prescriptive ethics. And in this article, he says he's only interested in descriptive ethics. So he's, he wants to describe why people do what they do. And he, he makes a very important point that our moral views uh, are often shaped by um, self-interest, right? And he says, this isn't just a personal evolution or whatever, but it's a, it's a social one as well. I like this quote uh, on the same page, I believe. No, page 18. Uh, no, sorry, sorry, same page. He says, uh, many like to think that there has been moral progress. It seems reasonable to suppose that at least one form of moral progress consists in moving from one equilibrium to a unanimously preferred one. Uh, this this property of irreversibility of change seems to be a hallmark of what we consider moral progress. So that irreversibility of change says we can't go back to the old way, right? So so that's a notion that we see a lot politicians talking about being on the right side of history. So that's that's a notion that that idiotic idea of being on the right side of history. Uh, seems to think that there is a moral evolution and moral progress in society. And if you've studied history, if you've studied anything, you know that progress is a silly notion. It's a, it's a religious notion that has been transplanted into the secular landscape uh, by means of, well, I, I suppose by, by a sort of a Christian and Ju Judeo-Christian influence. But you can also see it in terms of the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, and uh, notions of uh, Darwinian evolution and so on. The, uh, but it's, it's simply silly. And, and the author says that basically the relationship between game theory, the, so our human interest in our, in, 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 in what we want, so what we want um, uh, in a material sense informs our moral sense, right? 
So again, I've given examples before about uh, marriage and sexuality and so on. Kant once said that ought implies can. So if I ought to do something, it means I can do something. I think it's also interesting, and I've said this, please don't be bored with me if I've said it too many times, that uh, can often means the opposite, that we ought. Okay, so uh, that something can be done means it should be done. And that doesn't follow logically at all. Um, but take an example of like abortion. We can have abortions, therefore in situation X we should have abortions. Okay, so you can see how there's a disequilibrium there. Game theory, um, you know, Kuhn is right in this. He says that game theory uh, it gives us an interesting insight into why people believe what they believe, right? They believe morally what they believe oftentimes because it's um, self-serving, right? Um, and the equilibrium he's talking about here is the status quo. He says that how this how how culture or society is is set up right now, the equilibrium is is a is a moral viewpoint, right? That says that because this system is benefiting me, this system is morally just. Okay, so game theory also brings up ideas of uh, people who benefit the most, people who suffer the most, uh, people who are somewhere in the middle. And uh, talks, uh, there's also an interesting uh, subsection on mixed populations. Now, mixed populations are people with different theories about how to play the game. And um, let me offer this interesting thing. Um, he talks about invaders who bring in new strategies and new strategies change the whole dynamic of the game. Uh, I kept thinking in this, I kept thinking about when I play poker, um, I find that I can win in a certain circumstance, but then if, an, if another player comes in, it changes the dynamic and changes the strategy of other people, and that interferes with my strategy. Um, so sometimes, and people, you know, I'm not much, <laughs> I would say I'm not much of a poker player, I don't bet money or anything because that would be stupid. Um, but um, I find sometimes that I can benefit when there's a, a, a bad player in the game and that better players than me suffer when there's a bad player in because they they're not doing things that are uh, in their own best interest. Well, that, that a really clever poker player would do because he doesn't know that he should be doing this. So he's upsetting the apple cart, right, in that sense. So he's, he's, he's introducing these uh, randomizing principles. Now, let me, let me just offer an interesting sentence here. On page 22, he has a simple line. He says, Eskimos abandon their aging parents while Japanese sacrifice for theirs. So isn't that interesting? These are two different strategies. I was always struck long ago uh, reading, I don't know what it was, maybe it was uh, Farley Mowat or something where it was said that the hunter always eats first. So if a, whatever, a seal or a caribou or a, uh, whatever was, was caught, the hunter always eats first because if the hunter dies, everybody dies. So it's not the women and the children first, it's the hunter, right? So isn't that interesting how the morality is informed by the circumstance. So today when we talk about women and children first and blah, 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 it's because, uh, you know, Kuhn is suggesting in so many words that our circumstance is such that that makes that appear moral, okay? He's not arguing a point that game theory is morality or that morality is game theory, but he is talking about various uh, intersections between the two. On page 24, he says, Students of game theory, uh, of course, are well aware that game solutions often call for mixed strategies. The challenge for those who want to apply the theory to moral philosophy is that moral rules do not. Mo no moral philosopher could plausibly suggest that we ought to consult a randomizing device before deciding whether to kill a child or whether to keep a promise. So he's, sho he's showing that you know, randomizing might win in a game of poker, but it's, it's essentially an amoral or immoral strategy. Um, so he says, uh, at the end of that page, he says that uh, 
the lesson to be learned from this challenge of, of, uh, of uh, randomizing is that moral philosophers ought to distinguish two subjects, a theoretical one that tells us what we actually ought to be doing and a practical one that tells us what we should try to do. So I'll let you think about that yourself. The theoretical subject may be of interest to philosophers, he says, but the practical subject is the one that should interest all of us. Okay, so um, then he talks about cycles and he has all these uh, charts and different things about cycles. Um, he says uh, on page 27, the phenomenon of stable cycles and cycles is strategies. So what people do at one period of time, they won't do at another period of time. And, and there's this constant back and forth between things like I, I think of, of marriage, like um, marriage is declining right now at a, at a very rapid rate. And I often see that it's it's they never say they never say that marriage rates are at their lowest ever. They say they're at their lowest rate since, um, I don't know, 1960 or 1940 or 1920 or something. So that doesn't that look like a cycle? And these cycles are, are moral, are morally informed, aren't they? So when we look at why marriage rates are dropping today, there's lots of moral reasons for it. And sort of one of the things that I see very often is that declining marriage rates have a great deal to do with the fact that laws are not in men's best interests. So, so the marriage contract obliges men uh, financially, but it doesn't guarantee them anything and it doesn't uh, benefit them in any way. So the way the law is set up now in the West is that a woman can divorce a man whom she's agreed to love, honor and obey all her her life in sickness and in health until she doesn't want to anymore and that she's entitled to whatever half his money or whatever okay there's different uh, calculus calculi or calculations about how much money she gets but a man can't enforce the contract but it can be enforced against him so that's one reason why they say that moral marriage rates are dropping but they're not at their lowest ever why well, if we look back, there were different things running through culture at the time, such that uh, maybe it wasn't in women's best interests, maybe it wasn't in men's best interests, or maybe it was war, or maybe it was something else. It was health, it was disease, I don't know. But you can see that these are cycles. And uh, again, on page 27, I'm quoting, the phenomenon of stable cycles is uh, of course, quite familiar in the population biology of plant and animal species. Similarly, if our interests are confined to descriptive ethics, then the existence of stable cycles is not problematic. Moral beliefs and attitudes do sometimes appear to change in a cyclical manner. Our, attitude towards, our attitudes towards drug use and sexual promiscuity, to take two examples, seem to be getting more judgmental in recent years and getting more per permissive. Uh, oh, sorry, and after getting more permissive through the 60s and 70s. So, um, from the perspective of normative ethics, the existence of stable cycles is somewhat more puzzling, blah, blah, blah. So, it's interesting, isn't it, that, um, that um, our values go up and down, change and adjust. And right now, like if we take, for example, <laughs> The whole racism thing um, it's interesting I think that uh, and it's been pointed out that the word racism is losing its power um, because it's been overused so it probably peaked around 2020 with the George Floyd thing and it's been so overused since then that it's losing its strength so uh, racism the term racism is losing its cultural punch so we can see for instance that the strategy of of uh, overcoming your enemies uh, what they call uh, and racial grifting for instance like people calling everything racist and getting paid a lot of money by companies uh, because they want to buy 
uh, your your approval, you know, whether that's of the W, uh, the NAACP, or the Su Southern Poverty Law Center, or whatever, these companies have been buying uh, seals of approval from these company from these uh, race race grifters, like S Susan D'Angelo and and all that and all those people, that that's losing its cachet. So the strategy of buying approval or a seal of approval like say for instance if it's coke or if it's microsoft or if it's starbucks buying the seal of approval from whatever NAACP or whatever is losing its uh losing its strength so it's not worth the same money anymore and we can see as well that for instance uh different companies like right now target uh the, the uh the store target <laughs> is sort of backtracking a bit on its um, pride, its, its gay support uh, right now because there's, they're suffering a backlash uh, via, you know, related through the Dylan Mulvaney and Bud Light stuff. So that these, this pro-gay uh, strategy is starting to run its course and it's proving to be not as uh, winning. So you can see that this strategy is dying off. So it's interesting that, you know, claims to race of racism have made some people very rich, like, for instance, um, Patrice Cullors, who started the uh, Black Lives Matter thing. It made her very wealthy. But now that uh, that her company is um, uh, is losing all its support because uh, of her corruptness and also because of the whole thing is becoming less popular now um, it's run its course it's it's been played too much and so new strategies uh, to reply to racist accusations have to be are being implemented because they're losing their strength because they've been overplayed uh, more people are developing uh, are responding if, with a different strategy to accusations of racism, for instance. Or here's another great example of cycles and all that. The whole Me Too movement. That, uh, like, people, people say there's various reasons for the reason that the Me Too movement is, is dying. And it is still the case that if a woman accuses any man of rape or sexual abuse or say uh, whatever you call it sexual um i don't know what do you call it uh flirting or whatever in the workplace it's still the case that those are very uh winning strategies but they've also been uh they've also resulted in massive um lawsuits when they've been proven wrong so that companies now are being a little more hesitant so their strategy is a little more hesitant so you can see the game theory here coming into play where perhaps it's not sufficient just to take a woman's word for something. So, and uh, blaming Karens for everything, any, uh, any interaction between black people and, and white women um, that recently with, in New York there with the city bike thing, that, that uh, the old strategy of just saying white women are the worst um, is, is proving to be not uh, ace up the sleeve anymore because <laughs> simply speaking white women aren't the worst and black people aren't always in the right okay so there's there's cycles so um you know whatever whatever it is that causes these things to happen uh people adjust their strategies and the most uh blatant cases of course are those sponsored by corporations because corporations are very um uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, well, they're just, their interest is simply in the bottom line. How does, how do we make money? Uh, and, uh, they're going to change strategies. They're going to support whatever the LGBTQ agenda, if it brings, if it makes them look good and they're going to drop that, uh, if it makes them look bad. So, um, you know, Disney downplays black characters in movies they send to China and um, they 
they don't have homosexual stuff in their movies to the Middle East or whatever, and I, I guess China as well. So that these are strategies, and companies are very blatant in their strategizing. So expect them to turn, expect companies to turn against uh, uh, transvestites or whatever real soon when it becomes inexpedient, right? So um, there you go. So if if you want to, like, this article is very difficult, but you can get something out of it, and it doesn't have to be this article, but. Um, I encourage you to read about game theory just to get you thinking about how much of your own moral viewpoints and those of people around you are are act, are not are not unbiased uh, impartial um, views but are really quite self-interested and I talked about you know uh, recently I made the video on the bourgeois Jesus well that's the idea that uh, the, the what I was looking at there is people were, the the author of that article was saying that in a way that Jesus was upholding the standards and values of the time uh, and I said no he wasn't and um, that nevertheless there are aspects of Jesus moral teaching that do uh, uphold um, the standards of the time because the standards of the time aren't all just arbitrary notions and Marx's notion that everything in society is simply to keep the poor poor and the rich rich is simplistic right and the author mentions that here he says uh, he says Marx's observation that the the poor have nothing to lose but their chains is incorrect because they have a great deal to lose <laughs> right um, their life is not just chains and they have a great deal to lose as the Russian Revolution and Chinese Revolution showed, they had a great deal to lose. Even extremely poor peasants had a great deal to lose. And they did. Millions of them died. And millions of them went to prison camps and so on. So that's a lot more than losing your chains. That's being loaded up with more chains. Um, so uh, let me get back to the primary point here when I said that, for instance, Kant would say that the only thing in morality is doing a thing because it's right, not for any other reason, whether, you know, materially convenient or not. Kant says that that's all that matters is doing the thing that's right because it's right. But look at it this way. Um, is Do you have any more responsibility at all to make the world happy in, a sh in the short term? Okay, so we think of a lot of times where we sort of fudge justice and we fudge the truth to make people happy. Um, and is that wrong? So if one person has to die so everybody else is happy, is that wrong? Right. So there's a lot of cases where um, morality... And material benefit seem seem to depend on seem like that morality can't ignore can't ignore these things. One example, for instance, was uh, the I think from Sartre. I think uh, the author quotes Sartre. I think it is where he says that does does the Frenchman have an obligation to his dying mother or to the French Resistance? You know. Which, which is the more important thing? You know, cases like that. Um, how, how do you judge duty like that? So the French resistance, aiding the French resistance can help a million French people at the cost of caring for his dying mother. Whereas caring for his dying mother only helps his dying mother, right? So there's lots of situations like that, of course, where we can't ignore the material facts of the case. Um, a lot of people, I mean, this happens all the time, like, is my selfish need, maybe it's, it's moral in a sense, but maybe it comes at the cost of providing for other people, right? So um, if I have, I don't know, say I have agoraphobia, mild, mild agoraphobia, is it 
morally okay for me to sit at home because I'm scared of the, of the outdoors and of people while my children, you know, I don't earn money to feed my children, right? So it's cases like that. I mean, you can think of a million different ways in which uh, game theory, so doing what's beneficial is actually, actually involves morality, that morality depends on it. So that in many cases, you're morally obliged to do, to, to work, uh, to win the game, right? You're morally obliged to win the game. I hope I made that clear enough. But anyway, morality is not winning, right? Morality and game theory are not the same thing. I'm not a utilitarian or, or whatever. But I also have to admit that the two seem to have a lot to do with each other. So if you're a world-class brain surgeon um, who is trained and, you know, hundreds of thousands of resources have been put into you to become a world-class brain surgeon, and you would rather, you know, spend your afternoons in your wood shop making boxes and coffee tables do you have a moral obligation you know where, where's the moral obliga obligation in that so that's all i'm trying to say is that game theory is definitely useful in the whole topic of morality but morality and game theory are not the same thing so i hope that you will read up on game theory just m maybe even read a simple article online uh, look at the Wikipedia page, maybe, on game theory. Um, because it's interesting, it'll help you to learn to think about how other people act and how about how you act. All right, guys. Have a great day.